right. Yeah. So um, what I was saying is that we're adding about 2 million people into the workforce every year. We have a population that's very young. This isn't a mystery to anybody. And uh, in order to absorb this kind of population and make it meaningful for the economy to get a positive kind of a dividend from the youth bulge, we need to train them and we need to put them into jobs. And if we are under some misconceived notion that we will be able to revamp our educational institutes and the um, higher education institutes in the kind of time we need to assimilate these people, to train them and get them employed in the workforce, it's not happening. Even if we were to improve the quality of education at the institutes and increase the intake and make it financially viable for people at the bottom of <laughs> the pyramid to get education, uh, you you don't have the jobs available for that skill set because that skill set is, 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 is still pretty low. So we need to look at what's happening right now. This is a digital world. Learning is happening online and people are acquiring skills. There are entire professions that are being created today by skills acquired completely online, like artificial intelligence. It's because you, the main class for AI was a, was a Coursera class that was offered by Stanford on the internet. And most of the professionals in the field have had that class. This whole field has been created through this online curve. Likewise, we're seeing okay, the needs of tomorrow's world and economy is really skill-based. Acquiring certain skills, making logo design, how to do marketing on Facebook and Instagram, you know, artificial intelligence. Um, and these skills can be imparted online through the web. Hamara jo issue hai, jo masla hai, and I think this goes back to this problem that we've had with human resources. We have lost the path to innovation. We have become rent seekers. We are people who import, we don't export, no production. And one of the things that I've seen as a result of the virus is now this innovative gene inside the population has started to reawaken. And people are doing truly innovative things because they're having to reinvent themselves. We can't import, so people are starting to make things that we hadn't been making before. In that same light, we need to also revamp the way we engage talent with opportunity. And we need localized online training courses. Localized. Why are we all going to a Coursera or Udemy or Udacity? Amari Avam doesn't understand that fancy English. So how can we expect to train uh, a majority of the people entering into the workforce if we rely on these external tools to teach? We have such good educators in the country. Why don't we have these platforms of high quality online education, the training that follows the same kind of rigor that's happened everywhere else in the world? And then absorbing these people in skill-based jobs. So <laughs> you shortcut how you teach and train people. You then have them absorb the job market and then you take real data of actual jobs and skills needed in the market and you roll that back real time. I run rosie.pk. We see about 40,000 job applications every single day on that platform. There's tremendous data when you advertise your jobs and vacancies that should be rolled back into the educators and these online platforms. These online platforms thrive because Everybody can be a content creator. Anybody who sees an economic opportunity and has a certain skill can create his own class. So these online platforms iterate very quickly. They very quickly evolve course content that meets the need of the market. And our traditional education platforms can't do that. So, you know, these are a couple of the things that I think we should really focus on if you want to make a difference in HR and really want to make a dent in kind of where the GDP is growing. So this youth bulge becomes an asset and not and not a liability this is on one hand on the other side the very culture of how we absorb talent how we retain and how we groom is completely broken and it's broken in the private sector it's broken in a public sector it's much more broken in the public sector if you look at countries like you know to our east the singaporeans an official, a bureaucrat in the government is amongst the highest paid in the workforce and is amongst the most bright and talented. Amazing people are going into, into the government. And because of that, the policies are better. There's more of merit in the government. The corruption goes down because people don't need uh, that extra income, right? So these are bright people. In Pakistan, I think we're at a diametrically opposite. The salaries are much lower. 
and people have the power. And because you have power in the government, there's a lot of incentive to make side incomes. And that side income is rampant. Almost every, every place you look, there are all of these whole chains going down of this informal economies that are being run, you know, uh, through, through this, the corruption. Uh, so we need meritocracy. We need to hire the brightest people in the government, not the people who couldn't get jobs anywhere else. And I think this is one of the tragedies that we're seeing. And jobs are used as a weapon right now. It's used as a, as a weapon in the private sector. It's used as a weapon in the public sector more so. Politicians use jobs as a favors. So if I need votes, I need to get my people in my ilaka elect, uh, um, hired. So I will put the pressure on the bureaucrats or other organizations that are linked with, with the government. You need to hire them. Those people may have no skills whatsoever but put them on the payroll. Okay, next election cycle, I'll be able to get more votes from these people. The whole institution that you've built, the government institution that's built with our tax money becomes incredibly inefficient, becomes incredibly bloated, and no longer serves the essential needs of, of the people. So how do you get meritocracy in a government where the incumbent stakeholders are not aligned with the goals of the country. They're not. Unke, unke goals hai. Unke goals hai ke ji, I need to get reelected. Unka goal hai ke I need to make more money through my side economy that I've made in this post. So until you get that alignment made, you'll always be in a situation where jobs are basically a gift that's handed to promote the interests of a few people in power. And how can the country ever grow with that? How can you ever groom talent if the talent you're onboarding is at the bottom of the strata and now there's no incentive to groom that and to grow that talent you know and that's because essentially you can't so a meritocracy uh training using new means that we have at our disposal like online education and real-time data to figure out what are the skills needed in the job market realigning realigning the content creators with uh the economy and the needs of the economy and then getting this culture of meritocracy back and that's the biggest challenge and you sub gz and they're they're very easy for me to say here right i can say this all day long i know what's wrong fixing it i think is a challenge and i don't i don't have a solution especially when we speak about the government so these are the few thoughts i wanted to share i think we have tremendous opportunity right now in terms of our economy, human resources are our asset, ninth largest producer in the world of human workforce. That needs to be exploited. That number of ninth largest is going to go to five or six very soon as, as the population ages. So now is an urgent time that we need to equip them with the right skills. And now is a time that we need to change the cultural environment to retain these people to prevent the brain drain and your GDP will follow. So thank you, Munis. Uh, you, uh, you, you have to leave soon, you said. Me, I do. I have four minutes, Nadeem Bhai. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Uh, is Paul here? But before Paul, we ask Paul to speak, if he's here, I would ask, like to ask you a couple of questions. One is, Paul, is, um, you know, is the private sector, the corporate sector, are they used? Uh, aapki, aapki Hello, can, could you hear that? Nee, 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 I'm sorry, I missed the last. The, um, the corporate sector using you, um, the Rosie.pk platform to hire people. Are they using you for their corporate recruitment? Of course, of course. We have, gee, we have 65,000 um, HR organizations, um, you know, employers who are on our platform to hire so absolutely we have helped over a million placements is the government using you for no very rarely <laughs> you actually uh hit upon a nerve so a government largely doesn't use rosie hmm. uh and that's because of various reasons and majority is because transparency and who is hired is not hmm. something that people want they want to be able to pick and choose who they're hiring through various means. NTS, test leak. Essentially, you want to get your people into the job, right? That's fairly understood. And the few times we have engaged with the government, we 
we've had a few times where it's worked well as well. I'm not saying it hasn't. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. it's more majority of the time the question asked to us KG, we need to introduce your system because we want it to be transparent so we need mm -hmm. to show that we're transparent but mm -hmm. what, what about the corporate sector for example if they are hiring management level positions will they go through you or will they not yes they do so we have helped uh, hire CEOs of organizations and banks even okay okay so that's pretty good and what do you think of the training or hrm of a corporate sector forget the government a corporate sector their hrm and their training what do you think of that okay uh, most companies don't have any sort of meaningful training mm -hmm. the companies that do have a budget for training which are the larger organizations their budget also then starts revolving around essentially relationships that they might have with trainers and us maybe there's a lot of kind of money that comes back through the back door us mm -hmm. maybe uh, so as 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 a result um you're seeing that um the kind of training that's actually being imparted is 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 really not that good, but the organizations are spending on it. And these are the organizations that have a larger size. Small organizations can't afford to do it. But what is happening, I'll tell you a really interesting trend. Interesting trend is if you look at uh, software houses, the, the software <laughs> companies, for example, are training their employees. How are they training it? They buy memberships to these online learning platforms like Udacity, like Udemy, like Coursera. And after they hire, they say to their employees, I want you to take this class on C-sharp, on you know, Ajax, on this, X, Y, Z. And Unki employees, now they learn those skills online through these classes. Mm -hmm. And this is phenomenal. This is happening outside of any initiative that we have tried to take as a country or as a government or as a corporate. This is happening because these tools are available and small companies are gravitating to them. Mm -hmm. Pakistan, the government, needs to build these learning management systems, these platforms where we can pick and choose localized classes in Urdu, in Punjabi, in Sindhi, in Balochi, in Pashto, right? Mm -hmm. So people can absorb these skills and get practical skills that allow you to get hired and earn money. Okay. And soft skills are good, but I think we have too many trainers who are doing soft skills, you know? Okay. Okay, okay good, good. Do you have time to take two questions before you go? Sure. I hope Paul is here by then. Is Paul sure. Here? Let's do it. <clears throat> Let me go get Paul. You take the questions. Go ahead. G, what's the question? Any questions, folks? Go ahead. I think we had somebody, uh, Sandhya Hussain. Yes, hello. G, Islam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, this is Sandhya. I'm calling from Islamabad. Uh, I have just a quick question for you is uh, I was working with the company uh, Web HR. It's a cloud HR software. Oh, I know okay. them very well. I know them very well. Yeah. Yes. So we actually kind of had this opportunity to collaborate with you. And mm -hmm. we where will be having your API, the software API and with our software so we can combine it as we have a number of employee, a uh, number of uh, clients, they need Rosie. And then they say that, okay, we're gonna buy your software, but we need Rosie with you. And sure. we try to offer uh, the services with you, but I think you a couple of times deny it. So may I know the reason of that? Oh, no, we would love to do it with you. We would love to do it with you. In fact, I know your CEO and his wife very well. Who are <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we also have a collaboration with them uh, uh -huh. for the Saudi market. So we're actually helping you resell your product in the Saudi market and we're integrating it with our platform there. We'd love to do it in Pakistan. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to check with them with, again good. because I, I'm not well. working with them anymore. But definitely that will be a good platform where we can engage uh, right. collaborate with businesses. Yeah? Yeah. Thank you. All right. So Paul, are you there? Is Paul there, please? I don't see him, I think. Does anybody know if Paul is here? Mansoor sir, check here. Mazeen sir, in the meantime, can I can I ask a question to Monas? Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, hi Monas, this is Amir Durrani. How are you doing? Hi Amir, how are you? I'm very well. I see that you are also, how's the exercise routine going? Well, 
that's going really well. I think it's what keeps I, me. I, I, I see your updates there. Anyhow, very quick question. This is relating to what you were suggesting on the government front. Um, basically, you know, uh, the government has its own set to NC, the National School of Public Policy, through National Institute of Management, and through the National Defense University. Have you had any inroads in trying to collaborate on your suggestions, what you said? And I totally agree with you on, on the amount of training the government needs. Have you had discussions or inroads in these three entities? I have not. And I'm a bit wary to do it because, you know, um, I've had so many discussions with very good people in the government, very well-meaning. And Islamabad, I mean, there was a time when I was driving to Islamabad almost every day for meetings at the PM house and other locations. Tremendous amount of time and energy, even though you have a sponsor who's very eager, things get stuck. So the end result is it's very, very, very frustrating. You have to have horizons of maybe a year or two years to get something done because there's so many wheels that need to be turned so i have not i would love to engage that but you know also very mindful that um there's an opportunity cost of that time especially if things don't don't actually ever happen but i would be open to doing that okay a quick follow-up question Nadine, so sorry just a very short one um in terms of the basic premise i mean in our last hr session we were struggling with the fact and there was a lot of feedback um, that we all provided to Nadim Saab that basically it is very difficult to find the right skilled people in the market. And uh, is that something by and large a statement that you support? Um, yes and no. Yes, in the sense that if you're looking for some very specialized skill sets, they are tough to find because they're rare. Examples, for example, in the online world, this new online economy that's uh, growing very quickly in e-commerce and the kind of people who understand those business models to be your product managers, to be your you know, sales head, they're very few because we just haven't had enough of those operations in Pakistan to train people through. People really learn on the job. A small percentage of what they learn is acquired in the education. So if you don't have those jobs flowing through the economy in abundance, then hiring people with that skill set is also harder. There are some skill sets which through online aggregation become a lot easier to hire because you can look for highly specialized people through the keywords, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. It's not easy still because the best people are not looking for jobs because the best people uh, get the best treatment from their employers. Employers realize how valuable this person is and they make sure that person never leaves them. So they probably won't even be in the job market. So these are challenges that you have. But I think skills and there are a large number of skills which are currently hard to find. But if you do this online training, for example, like you like UX, user experience design, very tough niche field, online classes and that within one week, you can get pretty good at it. Like I've seen with my 12 year old child, you know, now he's doing user interface screens for me. And I hope nobody finds out because of child labor. But uh, so I think a lot of those hard to get skill sets can be augmented by online as well. Okay. Okay. Anybody else, folks? Uh, sir, can I ask something? Uh, this is Mahmoud Khalid. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I have a question that can you bring out certain projections for the future jobs? Because in Pakistan, I believe that after matriculation, we take about four to five years to prepare a kid for the particular professional jobs. So if you can let, like, say project something which is coming, which is going to be required in the coming future based on your data, whatever is coming into you. And the second thing is that do you think that we can, we need to go back from our matriculation as well? For example, going into vocational and other sorts of training abandoning this conventional system of education? I don't think we should abandon anything. Uh, in terms of projecting jobs, we have done a very, very detailed study with World Bank. That report is available. I will uh, email it out soon to Nadeem Bhai and he can see it. Their economist and um, you know, data analyst worked with our team to analyze all of the jobs on demand side, all of the skill sets on the supply side, we matched them up. We found where the gap was. It's a beautiful, beautiful study that we did with the World Bank. I've tried to send it everywhere. Everybody says, ha ha, please, I'm here. I've sent it everywhere. Inside 
the government, nobody's even opened it, right? This is another kind of tragedy. So yes, that information is available, it's possible. And this is exactly what I meant earlier in my talk when I said, if you corrupt these online systems in which you're aggregating the demand for talent through job postings, you get such good real-time uh, information that goes back to the trainers and educational institute. A four-year educational institution will not be able to spin around that very quickly. It will take them two years to do it. That skill set might be obsolete again. This is why I'm saying this online content platform where an expert who knows there's a demand for this course launches a course in two, three weeks and then starts to train people online and has a, has a profit opportunity over there as well. What was the other question? I'd like a quick question. I got a question. This is Naseem Big, if I can have a question. How are you, Naseem Zab? How are you? Okay, okay quick like question. A... Can, can you start uh, producing data for, for, for investment analysts as to what sector is hiring more? And therefore, for me to be able to have a view on, on a business sector and, and uh, from, from an investment perspective, are you already doing that or can we connect with you to do so? You can absolutely do that. What I will do is I will share with you the study we did with the World Bank. It's a very detailed okay. study. It shows you uh, which areas are hiring and where there's a shortfall and where there's a surplus. So we've got a very, very detailed study on this, which I'm sure you will enjoy. So after this call, great. I will make sure that I have that. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, have, I have a question. Nadeem Saab, I got a yes, question. Yes, sir. Bolie, bolie, bolie. And uh, I'm, I think maybe both uh, Pied and Monis can perhaps answer it. I'm, I'm just wondering whether um, uh, Rosie ka jo data set hai, employees ka data sets, prospective employees ka data sets, uh, can it be used to come up with some uh, proxy indicator of unemployment on a monthly basis? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely it can, uh, because we're doing that right now. I'll just share with you. Uh, our job postings have dropped about 50% since April 3rd. So the number of jobs that we're seeing on our platform have seen a very, very, very steep drop. Uh, and um, what's also emerged is the 50% that are hiring. There's a very clear trend of who those people are, who's actually hiring right now. And it turns out to be the IT companies. IT companies are still hiring. They're trying to scoop up the talent that's available in the market by people who can no longer afford to pay those employees because they have international clients. And international clients get a discount when they outsource work to Pakistan. And that hasn't been... Uh, exploited enough in the government. IT is one of the best sectors of our economy, which I think has been treated as a redheaded stepchild. We don't have a cost of goods for our exports. This, uh, whatever we make through our IT is human, human skill. So we don't have to buy raw, raw material and import them. We're using the foreign exchange and then export and then you know make a margin. This raw material is completely available in the country and we have a pricing advantage and we have a large base so if we focus on honing this large base in IT, even in tough times like this, it's turned out to be one of the most vibrant of all of the sectors in the economy. Could, could we then expect Rosie to release these data sets uh, periodically, like maybe on a monthly basis, uh, mm -hmm. uh, job postings and, and, and the number of candidates put, putting up their CVs for looking for jobs and so on and so forth? We'd be happy to. We have all of that information exposing it is not a problem. Uh, so happy, happy to share that with anybody who is actually interested in that. Morris, I suggest you share it to PID, not the newspapers. We'll sell it to them. Okay. I'm afraid of the newspapers. These guys, these guys always like a free ride. So perhaps you'll have to buy it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't realize that, uh, that the one question was asked on newspapers. We've got a special rate for you. Please, yeah. Media ko koi cheez muftin Media ko koi cheez muftin deni. Sahi baat hai. Sahi baat hai. Manas, dekho. Ek cheez, please. Can you tell us if if you had to kind of categorize the jobs that are in demand on your on Rosy? What would they be? What kind of jobs will right now offhand? Let's just purely off the top of your head. What what kind of jobs would be in demand pre-COVID? I'm not talking about COVID. What kind of jobs okay. would be on demand pre-COVID? Pre-COVID, um, the marketing, especially online marketing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. hot demand. Because even SMEs, your small shops, 
mm. stores and the restaurants and they realize that this is the world of this new economy. They want somebody to manage their Facebook page and their Instagram and to optimize and run advertisements. So this is a very hot skill and it's mm -hmm. very trainable, but in short supply, very trainable. You can train a person to do this in one month through online classes or all classes up in Urdu and they mm -hmm. should be high. Quality. So that's mm -hmm. one area. The other area has traditionally been IT and IT name, the skill set vary over time, right? So there was a time when if you knew how to make a website, you were really hot. I know PHP key programming because we evolved from, you know, technology. Now it's, do you know how to make an Android application? These are also very trainable skill sets. So Android applications are there. Uh, sales. We have a country that has a retail kind of footprint. That's very large. Everybody's trying to do sales. So there are a lot of jobs for sales. But sales, there's also a saturation because there are a lot of people who are interested in those jobs for sales, right? So there isn't that much of an imbalance there. There's kind of a balance there for sales. Uh, mm -hmm. Accounting and finance, which I think is oversupply. The number of uh, professionals who have a degree in accounting of some sort is in is an oversupply. Um, mm -hmm. And we do have a lot of jobs, but everybody who wants a respectable kind of job or a profession goes into accounting and you know, all of that kind of stuff. So these are the rough kind of areas. IT may both specializations like cloud computing, data analytics, uh, you know, artificial intelligence. Yes, sub both hot. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. Well, thanks, Moines. Thanks a lot. Since you have to go, we'll uh, uh, let you go. Paul Kaiser is here now. So Paul, can I invite you? To take over when Monas left off, um, it seems that human uh, resource management in this country is a mess. We have no human resource management, especially in the government. And uh, we have no human resource management, even in the private sector, which seems to be very, very kind of sheepish about the private. The only thing that people demand is IT services, which is fair enough, which I don't mind at all. But uh, the question is where you do, Paul Kaiser does a lot of training um, in, uh, in the corporate sector. He's been around for a long time uh, in Pakistan, one of the few people who is working hard in Pakistan. He joined, came here as Nestle, but now he runs his own firm called Talent Games. And I'd be very interesting to, interested to learn about Talent Games, but I'd be interested to get your perspective, Paul, because you have, I believe you have a very wide perspective on uh, uh, HRM in Pakistan. Uh, since you've probably dealt with all the corporates and you've done their training and you've done their analysis. So we're looking forward to hearing from you as to what the state of human resource management in the country is. So Paul, over to you. Paul, can you hear me? Hello? Can you turn on your mic? Yeah, of Good. course. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you, thank you, for that. Of course, uh, I, I, I think it's a nice, it's a nice uh, putting oil on the fire to make a statement that HR practices in Pakistan don't exist. Uh, that's obviously not the case, uh, because that that would diminish a whole uh, a whole profession of thousands and thousands of 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 professionals who spent their life's work in uh, in implementing uh, or trying to get the, the maximum performance out of individual teams and organizations. Um, if you would ask me, Paul, is, is there a difference between government and, uh, and corporate? Yes, of course, there is a difference between government and corporate. Uh, and there's also a significant uh, difference between uh, public-private enterprises and, and, uh, and private, uh, private businesses. I'm not really, uh, really familiar with, with the HR policies and uh, procedures of, of, the, of the government. Uh, because, I've, to be honest, as a, as, a, uh, as a professional, I've tried to steer away from uh, from from the government uh, sector for two reasons. One is that it's not my expertise and I can't really add value. Uh, and secondly, is because there's very little demand for uh, for people with my uh, with my skill set. Uh, and that, by definition, of course, is a is an indication that uh, that uh, the willingness to invest in in people is is a, is a is a big is a big thing. Um, on on the on the profession on the on the corporate side, I actually don't think that uh, that uh, uh, it is uh, it is in a bad state whatsoever. Uh, I do, of course. There's a tremendous uh, range from uh, mom and pop shops where there is no HR. Although I think some of the uh, some of the the owners of some of the smaller 
uh, enterprises are doing better HR than some of the bigger enterprises. Uh, to, of course, the, the large corporations that have got extensive number of people employed in the HR function. Uh, so from that perspective, I think, I think there's, and that's, that's not different than from any country in the world. Uh, and I've, I've worked in quite a few countries around the world, and I don't think there's any difference in that, in that diversity. Uh, what I actually have seen over the last 18 years that I've been associated in, in Pakistan, that I've been living here in Pakistan, I've actually seen that, uh, that there's a significant improvement in the way that corporations are uh, investing uh, not only just in the development of people, but also in, in getting the right people in terms of their recruitment, in terms of their reward mechanisms, in terms of their, how they engage employees and how they in, try to instill a number of corporate values. Uh, um, and you've tra seen a tremendous shift from uh, the, the two early 2000s, where everything was around multinationals that, uh, that took the lead. Uh, to, I think, at the moment, where large, co uh, large national corporations are actually more innovative in terms of HR practices uh, and more successful in terms of businesses than some of the multinational corporations. I can, I can talk for three hours, but I don't, I don't think that will be very interesting. For your for interesting for your guests, so I rather I rather do this in a in a question and answer type of uh, type of uh, of mode, or in people sharing other perspectives, and of course being able to uh, to add, add my two cents to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Paul, uh, let, let, let's just quickly hear about this. For example, what are the hiring and um, sort of firing and management of human capital practice in the large firms? Do we have a good market in talent for large firms? Do people move between these large firms? Are they recruited on a on a on a basis of merit, or they are, are they recruited on the basis of who they know? On a scale from zero to ten, I gave that an eight. Okay, so that's pretty good. Well, so they're, they're recruited. Good. Okay. Okay. And yeah, what about similar, similar on firing, similar on development, similar on engagement. If you look at the top uh, 100 organizations, I'm not looking for definition on the stock exchange because I don't think that's a reflection of, uh, of the, uh, the most, uh, the most progressive, progressive uh, corporates in Pakistan. Um, uh, but I, I think if you look at the top 100 progressive organizations in Pakistan, I am certainly give that an idea. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. And is there a good market? Is there a good market for talent in the country? I mean, do people cross over from, let's say, Engro to, um, oh, well, to Bank of America, to Bank of America, to whatever? And, no, absolutely. And and you see you see you see a a, a, a transfers happening within organizations. You see transfers happening coming. People going outside. You see transfers happening. People coming back. Uh, and I think that's been a very, uh, and obviously the current situation is putting a little bit of a, uh, of a spin on that. Uh, but I don't, and an and economic situation goes through ups and downs. Uh, but over the last 10 years, I think that overall you've seen significant improvement in talent practices across uh, the most progressive organizations. And I certainly think that, that if, I would, if it would have asked me 10 years ago what would grade you would have given it, it's probably six, six and a half, and I, I sincerely give it now an eight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, just, uh, just I, I do a, I do a biannual uh, engagement survey to identify the best places to work in Pakistan, and the, the the companies that are ending up at the top actually have an engagement level measured through surveys of employees that scores mm -hmm. significantly higher than what the global best practices are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in my view, you can't fake that. Sorry? You can't fake that. You can't fake that. Sorry, I didn't get that last sentence. You can't. I said, I said and in my view, you can't fake the scores that come out. So I, 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 it's proper data, proper employees that are being asked to answer questions on an anonymous basis. Good, good. Okay, then why? Uh, and good? you have to be very smart in order to fake it in a world. Fair point. Say it again. Okay. Uh, I said, why is it that we get the impression that most of the companies in Pakistan are not professionally managed? They still seem to be owner managed uh, and the professional management doesn't seem to be at a premium.
Uh, yeah, well, if, if, I, if I talk to you about the top 100 most pro progressive companies, that is just a slither, of course, of all corporations in Pakistan. And per definition, therefore, the statistical chance of you uh, and you, uh, you uh, interacting with the 99% that's underneath it is, of course, significantly higher. Uh, so yeah, uh, in the uh, in in the in the top ten percent, I think you will see some semblance of professional talent management and HR management. In the bottom ninety percent, you see that uh, you don't see that. Uh, mm -hmm. And but I don't think that specifically different for Pakistan as it is for Bangladesh or it is even for the UAE in that matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you think that uh, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, UAE, there's not much of a difference in talent management. And what are the key differences you'd see? No, I don't. I don't think there's, there's, there's specifically key differences. Uh, there's there's maybe maybe differences in the number in the percentage of companies that use those practices. But in terms of again, in terms of the most uh, most progressive companies, I don't I don't think there's any specific difference. And I actually I actually think my that my Pakistani brethren are mm -hmm. in some cases even slightly more innovative than uh, than some of the other countries. Mm -hmm. Okay, what about training in these companies? Now you do training and you do this talent games. What, what is training? I, 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 I actually do very little, very little actual actual training. My, my focus is specifically on leadership development and facilitation. Um, so, uh, so I, I, I don't do large, large training training sessions. But, but okay. I think if you look at the, um, if you look at the 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 the, 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 uh, the Number of trainers that are employed in Pakistan and how they are how they are booked. Uh, it looks like there's a significant demand for for, for training. Again, it may be the top 300, 400, 500 companies, and not the next uh, next 120,000. Mm -hmm. uh, but the majority of corporate professionals in Pakistan do work in I think in the top thousand companies in, uh, in that that we would know of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, what about? Uh, I think it's just a measure of of, of uh, what, what what your target is. If your target is every every organization that employs somebody else, mm -hmm. uh, then of course there's a, the, then then you could then you could question across the whole board what is the level level management of of HR and uh, talent practices. You probably come to a one or a two. But if you then narrow that down to the ones that are actually ever uh, have heard of it, have want to make the investment, I sincerely think that uh, that uh, that it's not it's not it's not too bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, tell me the other impression that I have, and I think many people have, is that let's look at the companies in Pakistan. If I take the top few companies, they're divided into the first few. The largest companies are government owned, like, uh, you know, Fauji Fertilizer, like Fauji Foundation, or like OGTC or PSO, etc. Then come the multinationals. And uh, the multinationals are obviously, we know them, they're small enterprises of the larger global companies. And then come the Pakistani companies. Uh, so the multinationals generally seem to take Pakistanis at the lower end of the stream and send them overseas. And those people either never return or they come back. One of them comes back for a CEO stint, and that's how they run the company. They, they it's a basically. No, 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 I, think, I, think, I, I think that was in the, I think that was in the 2000s. That's not, that's not okay. happening anymore. Uh, okay. First of okay. all, they can't, they can't afford it. Okay. Uh, so yes, one or two people will go abroad, uh, yeah. but majority, majority will actually be continue to be part of the organization and grow. Uh, okay. And number of expats coming into Pakistan is is very very limited. Um, so subsequently, uh, mm -hmm. uh, some, somebody starts presenting at the moment. I don't know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Go ahead. Uh -huh. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I think I think I think I think that is a, that is a relatively uh, that is that is a that is. It's a statement of, of 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 the of the past. I think actually the multinationals. Um, there's only a very very few who are still regarded as leading the the large local organizations in terms of HR and talent practices. Uh, I think in terms of innovation and in terms of uh, if, in terms of uh, um, uh, <laughs> Uh, new uh, new practices that that really tries to attract, develop, and engage people to get to more higher performance. I really think that some of the local companies do it now significantly better than the multinationals. And the reason is very simple: the multinationals have all moved into a, a strict hierarchical control 
in which uh, whatever is being set from the center has to be implemented in the country. And the um, HR director of multinationals, with a few exceptions, have almost no room for personal innovation and creativity. Uh, whereas uh, local organizations uh, don't have that, uh, don't have that uh, restriction uh, and as a result can freely uh, innovate. And I, my, my advice, and that's not just in the HR function, I think it's across all career streams. Uh, when people ask me, uh, Paul, what, what would, should, should, I, should I consider moving into a progressive local company? Uh, my advice always is that people have more opportunity to grow to contribute and to make an impact in, uh, in large progressive uh, local companies than they would be in multinationals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Paul, throw the floor open. Anybody wants to ask any questions? Let me see whether I, I, the... I have a suggestion. I think, uh, Paul, you have been uh, more optimistic than uh, many of our own people. And uh, one is encouraged <laughs> to listen to you. And especially uh, Mr. Nadeem uh, somehow uh, is not convinced that Pakistan is doing so well in this. Uh, I think uh, I need to interact with you uh, more in detail, in depth, so that uh, whatever research they do that has this element uh, of progression in this field uh, through your data. And I think it's very encouraging that you list our companies in these good practices even better than the multinationals. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. I actually do. And that's, that's, not, that's not me trying to uh, butter, butter people up. It's a, it's a general professional uh, 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 opinion. It was very valuable. Very valuable. Thank you. Paul, can anyone yes, hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay, great. Well, my name is Muhammad. Um, I recently returned to Pakistan. I spent most of my uh, years abroad working um, at firms in, in London and the US. And one thing I've noticed here is that there's a lack of perhaps talent or motivation, whichever you may want to call it, at the middle management level in Pakistan. And I'm curious to hear your view on what are some of the mechanisms that we can, as entrepreneurs, use to incentivize people? Is it a, is it a combination of management options, uh, setting KPIs? What would, do you think should be done at that level to enable the company to grow from a small scale level to a large, conglomerate well no, I've, I've got a very very simple belief in terms of uh, what what drives the success of uh, of organizations and you might uh, you might disagree uh, with the simplicity of that belief but I've, I've got significant number of data points that always and always come back to one single factor that drives the success of an enterprise and that is the quality of the leadership. Uh, the quality of the leadership to be able to, first of all, understand the direction and the, and the strategic context and being able to carve a way forward. Secondly, their ability to, uh, to engage their, uh, their, their, their to, to pick the right team and then subsequently engage them to make them part of the purpose and the mission that they have. And then subsequently give them the freedom and then the support in order to achieve that. And I can give you plenty of examples where I've seen exactly this same company uh, where the top leadership has changed, the rest of the middle management is exactly the same. And within a six to 12 months time period, I see a significant performance difference, uh, company performance difference, both positively as well as negatively. And I've seen even uh, positive, negative, positive, uh, or negative, positive, negative coming, coming to the forefront. And the only, the only difference in all, those, uh, in all those scenarios has been specifically the ability of the leadership to make, to make the difference. Uh, so if you specifically ask about middle management, I don't think it's so much around, it surrounds around all these uh, fancy reward mechanisms uh, around care options and, and all kinds of other long-term incentive plans. 
uh, that probably works in Silicon Valley, but in, in Pakistan, where, uh, where we are slightly lower on the muscle of hierarchy in terms of safety and, and financial needs, I think cash in hand is still the, uh, is still the, uh, the, 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 the driving factor. Uh, so the key is all about making sure is that people are being 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 paid uh, appropriately, not extensively appropriately, because I think extensively also leads to some sort of, sort of entitlement. And then it's all about making people part of the plan that you have, make them interested, make sure that they can have an impact, make sure that they have a freedom to make a decisions, and then uh, hold people accountable for their deliverables. But but that's that standard textbook uh, textbook answer. Okay, so just thanks, Paul. That's helpful. Just a quick follow up on that. So, in terms yeah. of the the things that you you'd want to see the leadership at at the top do on a more active basis, one is you mentioned uh, having a more decentralized decision making process. But what other can you be a bit more specific as to the day to day actions that the leadership can undertake? Yeah, I, th I think I think first and foremost is being absolutely clear about the direction and the direction. I don't mean six months from now, but specifically a couple of years from now. What is that? What is that north star that we're following? And then it's all around being present, be touching base with people, communicating with individuals in terms of how they, how their job contributes to that north star that you. Gonna go through, and what individuals can do in order to make those steps, and then it's all about asking them uh, what, uh, helping them understand the what and the why, but the how leave that to the individuals themselves. My experience in terms of uh, uh, Pakistani uh, Pakistani managers is that we are that we are promoted on the expertise on a certain subject, and as a result, we think that we constantly have to be teachers. And teachers not in terms of helping people discover answers, but teachers in, in helping people give the answers. And of course, as you know, if you, if you give people answers, then they won't grow as fast as if you help them discover answers. Uh, so I think, I think it's, it's about, it's, about uh, it's specifically around that. It's about constant communication, constant engagement, being clear of what you're looking for and, don't, and ask as many questions in order for people to understand how they need to do things. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you, Paul. All right, Mossum, I noticed that you have a, a question. Sorry, I didn't get that one, sir. Most of you asked a question around applying best HR practices to local company or create HR practices as per culture. Um, my, uh, I, I, I think my my preference is never to uh, to uh, slash range copy paste, as you call it in the old Lotus one to three uh, uh, jargon. Uh, so yes, get inspired by best practices, but then specifically find your solutions for your organization to work so that's that would be my answer to that question mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so paul i mean again if if i <clears throat> what i get from you is that I, hr practice are very good then explain to me why is it that our companies are not growing very rapidly if we've got good hr practices we've got very good hr uh, yet i see very small companies and i don't see them growing very rapidly do you yeah, again, I, well, I've I've seen I've seen some of these progressive companies growing very rapidly. Obviously, uh, take obviously some, but average. Take it. Yeah, no, but but again, that's the that's the difference of uh, of wavelength that we're on. Adi, uh, you're focusing on the average of the two hundred thousand companies that are there, and I focus on the on the better ones of the top five hundred companies. So I think I think there's a there's a difference wavelength. Uh, and obviously, so, if you are if you're company number fifty five thousand six hundred and twenty three. Uh, and you are you are a a a a, 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 tr a traditional minded a tradi traditional minded a traditional minded enterprise that is all about uh, preserving preserving capital and minimizing risk. Then obviously you look at at employing people at a twenty seven thousand rupee salary rather than and and trying to get as much much out of it as possible from a nine to five. Uh, uh, nine to five type 
of uh, time scale, uh, and obviously that is not an HR practice that I would uh, that I would uh, encourage. Uh, but uh, work from home has proven now for hundreds and hundreds of companies that I think uh, actually people not being present in the in the company and not being present in an office actually, in my view, companies have to uh, have to agree that that efficiency is significantly improved. Mm -hmm. uh, because suddenly nobody can no, nobody can do any go office office gossip anymore. So uh, so there's a lot of efficiency that's been won by actually people working from home. Uh, uh, so I think I, I really hope that uh, that the accelerator that the COVID has been is uh, showcasing to companies that some of these practices where it is all about control and authority is something that is is not going to work with the tools that we have. To, to in, in our uh, to our availability, uh, and if if people are not convinced after this that working from home and letting go of control and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, authority, then I then yeah then they are de destined to remain a small company, uh, and probably they don't want to become a big company. Hmm. Well, let me say I'm, I'm not talking about the top. Uh, sorry, I'm not talking about the uh, or the universe of 500,000 companies. I'm only wow. talking about the KSC 100. That's specifically what I'm talking about. Yeah. And in the KSC 100, uh, as I said, I don't see anybody really growing very fast. But leave that aside for a minute. Let well, me ask you this. Let me ask you this. For me, the KSC top 100 is for me the most, it's not the top 100 most progressive companies in Pakistan. Okay, okay. So what, in your opinion, are the most progressive companies in Pakistan? So, so I think I think if you look at for me for me as as, as a poster child at the moment is English biscuits. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if you if you if you see how English business biscuits mm -hmm. is outperforming the, the, the market in terms of growth, in terms of innovation, in terms of engagement of people, in terms of being able to attract talent, I think they're doing a fantastic job, absolutely fantastic job. Mm -hmm. uh, another poster child of and yeah, it's, you can It's probably not. It's it's part of a of a larger multinational group, but to be honest, I don't think it's a it's a it's a it's, it's a multinational uh, structure. It is a company called Jazz. Uh, yes, they are part of of Vion, but they've got 100% local authority in terms of what they do what they do here. Obviously, you've got you've got you've got the Angros of the world. Obviously, you've got the ICIs of this world uh, that are now local local run organizations. And I think the the Tavas have done tremendously well. In heaven, when they took over in 2012, everybody was scared of what they're going to do with this beautiful pearl called uh, ICI in terms of their growth and their abilities. And I think, I think they've done such a tremendous job by appointing the right people, by giving them space and invest in them. And they've, they've grown four or five times in terms of shareholder value in the last four or five years. So I think, I think those are fantastic examples. Yeah. Okay, good. But tell me another thing. What about the state of R&D and innovation in these companies? Do they, do they actually invest in that? And is, is sort of, are they investing in the best uh, talent in terms of R&D and innovation or not? Well, for me, for me, R&D and innovation doesn't exist in Pakistan. So mm -hmm. that's uh, that's uh, <laughs> if we are if we after forty years of of uh, of assembling cars still not able to make an own engine. Uh, if you, after 60 years of selling drugs, still not being able to do uh, to do research in terms of uh, molecules for pharma industry, for medicine, uh, if if our our uh, our textile industry still relying on the 1960 spinning machines, uh, then yeah, yeah, we're not uh, innovation and research is something that is not part of our genes. So what does innovation and genes mean in the context of HR? I get what it means in the context of pharma, but how, how are, what is the scope for recruitment? Oh, for recruitment, there's a lot of scope. I, I, my, the company that I run at the moment is called an HR technology company called the Talent Games. And uh, we have completely changed the way that people recruit, not by filling in a resume and having an interview, but by actually playing a game. Uh, so so uh, that that game allows people then to be to be assessed, and as a result, gets significantly better insight in the candidate's capabilities in an unbiased manner, where it creates a level playing field. 
and about 20 companies in Pakistan have taken taken that uh, that uh, that innovation and have made it now practice in their uh, in their recruitment uh, sphere. So you see a lot of innovation around around how you can use HR technology in order to improve uh, improve HR practices. But it starts first and foremost by uh, by the, the the mindset that that uh, that companies that, that companies uh, adopt. If you have a mindset of control, if you have a mindset of planning, if you have a mindset of uh, of authority, uh, then by definition you're not going to grow in the in the second uh, second uh, decennium of uh, well, the the, the 2020s. Uh, you really have to move to an organization in which your organization structure is networked, in which you've specifically given space to people to, 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 to deliver, in which you experiment, and in which you actually uh, be as transparent as you possibly can. Uh, but if you hold, hold on to the 1950 man management principles, then obviously your HR principles are not going uh, to be innovative at all. So I think, mm. I think there's a connection between them. Mm -hmm. Okay, folks, anybody else wants to ask any question? I'm, I'm, I'm too positive for you, Nadim. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm too yeah, positive sorry. for you. <laughs> No, not at all. Uh, I yeah. in, my, in my world, Paul, there's no such thing Optimistic. as positive or negative. In my world, there's only analysis. And uh, some people think analysis is positive. Some people think analysis is negative. I only think that we need to analyze the situation as it is. And, and you're right. I mean, you're right. We have no innovation. We have no research. So where I began, you were not at the, at, the, at the beginning. What I was saying was very simple. The reason I, as an economist, am interested in HR, HRM, is because of the fact that we economists have discovered, ever since uh, my professor and two of um, my colleagues won the Nobel Prize, that ultimately it is about the, the growth and development is about ideas. And the ideas come from good HR management, and in particular, innovation and research. I mean, it's lovely to have synth club people thinking that they are great HR managers, but if they're not doing innovation management, you already answered my question. If they're not doing innovation management, then I, I, frankly, these companies are not going to grow. So I think you answered the question very well, that everything is good, but for innovation and research. So, I mean, I'm happy with that. I'm very happy with that. So don't worry. So, Amir, go ahead, Amir. Yeah, so Nadeem, sir, sorry. Hi, Paul. Uh, this is Amir. Um, so, actually, I think you already ring-fenced what we can ask. Because you said you're working in the 500 and not the rest of the 200,000, so uh, the top. But still, you know, even for the top 500, there may come a time when you do a fresh pick from the lot in the country. Now, again, I'm again going to normalize this question by the fact that yes, if the top 500 advertise, you're going to get the top 50,000 of the applicants in the country. But by and large, the two things that we struggled with last time, we had a pre-session on this uh, a week and a half ago. Uh, the first thing is we all came to a realization that talent, talent, and you know it's a very difficult um, uh, you know definition, but talent is essentially missing in Pakistan. And what I mean by talent is uh, skilled people who can adapt to a work environment, no matter what you throw at them. They come out of universities with certain work skills. Secondly, within that talent, if you look at it, ninety percent have no concept of work, what is work ethic. And last part of that is that actually the market signals which, which tell you what are the best jobs to go for are missing. Therefore, when I interview, I mean, like even last four months, I've interviewed 300 people. I am, by the way, I have my own firm. It's a very small SME. Um, I find that almost everybody goes and gets a BBA, a business degree of some sort. And it, they are totally useless to anything that's got to do with analysis, thinking, uh, business development, you know, etc. So, have you, uh, number one, have you also, do you share these views? Number two, if you do share these views, uh, what do you think needs to change? And if you do not share these views, where am I going wrong in advertising and, you know? I think, I think, I think uh, where, where I, I fully, con fully uh, concede is that there is a, there's a complete disconnect between uh, between education and work practices yeah so I, I i think i think there's there's a 
I, I, yeah, the, the quality, the quality of graduates in terms of specific professional skills that are relevant for a professional environment uh, are completely uh, is, is not is not present. Yeah. Uh, uh, certainly, if you look at the amount of money that people pay, certainly if you look at the number number of people that 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 graduate. There's some differences in terms of very specific skills around engineering and accounting and all that kind of stuff, but but even even there, I I, I question I question sometimes the, the relevance of the uh, of of the the skills that are being that are being uh, that are being uh, given to them. Um, so my my approach always is that I that I. That, that, that I hire for the, the aptitude and the attitude that I see and that I, that I will be responsible for making sure that the skills that are required are being, are being given. Uh, and there you've got a second, uh, a second uh, uh, um, second issue, second challenge, is that, that the standard work ethic of people graduating from a university is, is, not, is not by definition the best that I've seen in the world. Uh, there are, of course, plenty of examples, uh, plenty of exceptions, but on average, the, the work ethic and the aptitude of people being graduated, I think, is, is not something that majority of them I wouldn't recruit. Yeah, so I think I think there's there's a significant there's a significant gap there as well. Is that to do with educational institutes? Is that to do with uh, with uh, upbringing? Is that to do with cultural cultural elements? I'm pretty sure it's a mixture of uh, all of the above. Uh, but yes, there are there are significant gaps there. Does that mean that there's no talent in Pakistan? No, because the number of the, the talent pool, the, the the people pool, is so big that. That there are people that are very that are very good that are the top five, seven, ten percent of that of that whole pool. Mm. Uh, uh, but yes, uh, I, I think I think this there's a, there's a big mismatch. I have a question. Please, sir, you need to bring Tariq Zuri into the discussion next time, please. You know this is this is exactly what we concurred last time. So I, I'm very happy to hear this from Paul. Look, I ask Tariq Zuri all the time, but this, he doesn't want. To. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Mere paas, I have a question. Go ahead. Ha, pa, uh, hi, Paul. This is Samia Altaf, and I, this question is regarding the pharmaceutical industry. I know yeah. it is in bad shape, but uh, I understand, and I've been following one of the firms, which is Get Pharma, for the past five, ten years, and yeah. they are doing uh, their own R and D. They are expanding very rapidly, and they are training their own people. So could you, could you, I just wonder while looking at them that uh, I wonder if it's possible to replicate that model, if it's a good one. Do you know about that company? Do you have anything uh, to say about I've not, never worked with Gets, but uh, I've, I've, I've worked with a lot of pharmaceutical companies uh, and obviously Gets stands out as a, as a, as a great success story. Again, for me, if you ask me, Paul, what is the key about Gets' success? It comes back to the to the leader, the CEO, and the owner that uh, that that has started this company and the vision the vision that he had. So again, for me, it's a data point that that fits with my uh, fits with my uh, hypothesis. Um, if you say Gets Pharma is doing a lot of research, yes, they're doing a lot of research, but on generics, they don't do any research on new molecules. They do very little, very little research in terms of uh, clinical trials. Uh, so, so still, still in terms of more fundamental research and innovation that I think Nadim is is moving for, I still think that uh, that there is some uh, some, some some gap. Uh, Gets probably does very similar things as the whole Indian pharmaceutical company has done in Pune, and has grown on on the on the on the back of it. So I fully endorse and 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 clap for their achievement. But if you ask me, are they leading the way in clinical research of new molecules? No way. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, let me uh, interject a bit and uh, talk to Paul. Hi, Paul. This is Shahid, uh, research fellow at MITE. Uh, uh, since uh, Dr. Uh, Samuel Taf raised the question of pharmaceutical firms, and I've written about it, I, in fact, wrote an industry. Uh, okay. Research Maybe. Just, just a few brief comments. First of all, uh, the reason that they don't uh, do research in new molecules is because it takes a lot of money 
yeah. to indulge in it, that kind of research. And in Pakistan, there is no certainty that they are going to re recoup their costs because there are no intellectual property rights. So the formula for the pharmaceutical or the drug is written right on the uh, package and it's easy to copy. And there is no, uh, nobody in Pakistan that can cash that. So uh, there is no incentive to do that. Then the, another uh, point, yeah, another point is that uh, predatory taxation. We've often talked about, talked about it. So there's this uh, government uh, government tax uh, on one percent of the gross sales of pharmaceutical firms. Uh, government extracts that tax in the name of it has been extracting that tax in the name of uh, research and development and uh, developing the uh, uh, commend, uh, the complementary uh, what I would say infrastructure for that which includes world-class labs that has been going on since 1976 they have extracted billions of rupees from pharmaceutical firms but there is no one lab in Pakistan that they've built and talk to the government officials and they would ask them where that money went and they wouldn't answer the question they won't answer the question so there is disincentive for pharmaceutical firms to indulge in that kind of research now, for, yeah. to all of the, uh, now, a few days ago, I don't know if anybody, uh, not just Paul, but anybody, if uh, they, uh, there was an article in the news on Sunday that 433 drugs uh, that the pharmaceutical firms have applied for uh, have been uh, on the table of the prime minister since one and a half year. And despite a Supreme Court verdict that they have to get registered or rejected within a specific time frame, I think it's one and a half month or three months. And the, what the prime minister did is that he uh, forwarded to another, he formed another committee and forwarded to them. So that's how things work in Pakistan. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 I fully agree, Shahid. I, I think at the end, oh, it's all about system thinking, correct? Uh, you have to see this as a, as a, as a whole system, ecosystem in which each different lever will have a significant impact. And whether it's to do with, uh, with brain, brain drain or whether it's to do with innovation and research and development, if all those levers are not, being, uh, are not glued in together, if you don't create an ecosystem, an Amazon, then, uh, then it's not going to work. And mm -hmm. so I, I fully understand it, I fully understand that. So it's not just one simple thing. Never, there's never going to be a single solution to this problem. It's going to, it's an mm -hmm. ecosystem problem. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, hello. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the, um, hello, uh, hi, Paul. Mm -hmm. um, this is Dr. Farida Faisal. Uh, I think we should, you know, um, maybe. Uh, change the discussion a little bit, make it a little bit more interesting, um, provocative maybe. Uh, my question would then relate to women in HR. Um, and uh, maybe, I, I don't know, uh, maybe uh, Dr. Nadeem uh, doesn't agree to this, but your comments, please, um, that uh, you think that uh, diversity does add value, one, and secondly, your comment on women as leaders. Oh, I, I want more. I want very much more, many more women as leaders. If we could just downgrade all the men to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to report to women, I promise you this country will, uh, will succeed. Uh, I give you one example of a, mater a maternalistic state that I've lived and worked for four years, which is Vietnam. In Vietnam, you don't see a man work. It's only the women that work. And I promise you the success of Vietnam is all to do with that. Ah! <laughs> now, man, come on, answer, please. <laughs> he, he keeps okay. very quiet. This is funny, though. <laughs> and Nadim keeps very quiet. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm totally listening to you. You are the star of the show, not me right now. Okay, anybody else? I've got a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, go ahead. Yeah, so it's a question for Paul, and I'm just sort of repeating what I already put up on the chat box, is that if Pakistan really has uh, talent, then why do sort of uh, wage rates shoot up whenever any new big bank or software house or, or even a restaurant, um, you know, starts, uh, opens its shop and starts looking for good talent, not mediocre talent, but good talent, suddenly you'd see that wage rates across whether they are servers at a restaurant or whether they are IT managers for a bank, wage rates shoot up dramatically, uh, like as if they are, uh, you know, a small floated stock. Uh, so 
I, I find the, I find the whole talent theory rather um, wishy-washy, really. But I, I'm happy to engage in a debate. <laughs> so if I agree with you. That there's, uh, but, uh, it's not. Uh, I don't. I'm not saying that there is plenty of talent in Pakistan. I, I was saying that there is a small, small sliver of very good talent in Pakistan. And as a result, I think that that, that justifies your uh, your point that the moment oh. that uh, that that a new bank opens up, what they do is they take the short, uh, well, they, they take the short way out and look for people that can do the job immediately. And as a result, because it's a small pool, prices go up. Uh, but there's two, two parts to this. One part is that nobody makes the effort to actually go the long route uh, by, by inducting people on the basis of aptitude and then training them uh, and then keep the co cost low. Uh, and secondly, we don't address the systemic issues that are around mismatch of education and uh, and uh, and work practices, as well as the mismatch in terms of our of our work ethic and aptitude. I think I think I've been uh, I will piggyback on what uh, Shweb Saab just said, hmm. and I've been uncomfortable throughout this discussion with the use of the word talent without its uh, its uh, its uh, definition. I think the word competency might be more useful because, you know, people have a talent for a lot of, um, you know, snarky things, but they really don't have competencies that are required to do the job. And Paul, you are right that the education system and the training environment is not providing them with those competencies. So I just make the connection that, uh, you know, really there is no market for those kind of competencies, which is why if if they are not if it was an invisible hand as the economists say those would be produced so you know where where how do we find solution uh, well I, to be honest, I, 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 that, I can't answer that question uh, because again for me it's a, it's a whole ecosystem uh, that uh, that that provides that answer uh, whereas from from incentives to schooling systems, whereas from uh, uh, upbringing to mindsets, whereas from role models to, so I, th I think it's all, it's about 1600 different little levers that will all bring together and, and, and achieve that, uh, that, uh, that, that momentum. Um, and if you ask me, is there a golden bullet? No, there's no golden bullet or silver bullet. Paul, <laughs> so going back to the incentives bit, and uh, I don't want to be going off a tangent here, but you mentioned, right, that cash is something that people value here more in Pakistan than, uh, than uh, incentive options. And I, and I sort of broadly agree with you, but when you're growing a company, you just can't afford to pay cash as handsomely as a uh, jazz or uh, a large multinational in Pakistan would. So, what do you see as an alternative to cash that could work in a developing geography like Pakistan, based upon your experiences? Yeah, so, that, so I'm, just, I'm just using my own my own startup as a, as a, as an example. I can't I can't afford angro salaries for people, not not at all. So the only the only way that I can do that is provide people with a. a a level of cash that they feel comfortable with, but then find other ways for them to make it more interesting. I can't provide the insurance benefits. I can't provide the nice coffee shop type of environment, coffee office environment that they have. But what I can do is right, I can in, uh, uh, I can create an environment where people have significantly more impact. I can create an environment where people can really showcase their own creativity. I can get an environment where they're being uh, where they're being exposed to significantly more different experiences. I can be create an environment where decisions are being taken much faster. I can create an environment where they can work from home, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I can do other stuff that big companies are not able. The jazz of the the engros of this world is not able to do, uh, and that's how I compete. Uh, and uh, and still, I lose people to Unilever or to others when they when they find a job, and that's fine. I I just find a new graduate on the block and start all over again. And it is about that mindset that you're not going to recruit people for the next 16 years. You're going to recruit people for six months, and your whole system has to be has to be created that you create people 
an, a, a meaningful environment for six months, get as most much possible out of it as possible, and they will then transfer that knowledge to the next person that comes within you for six months. Okay. <laughs> so I guess then uh, uh, what I've been able to gather is you, one can't really expect a hundred percent retention rate of, of employees. That's that's unreasonable to expect. So, what do you would you say is a is a reasonable benchmark to to have? And if you're hitting that, you can think to yourself and pat yourself on your back and say, "Look, I'm doing a reasonably good job with retaining my employees." For 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 my for my own staff, people that that are that are excellent resources, if they're able to keep them. And make them make them effective within four weeks, and then keep them for another 11, 11 months. I've done a great job. Okay, okay, that's all. Awesome. So, Paul, tell me, just a quick reflection before we close on uh, public sector human resource management. How do you see that? Uh, I've got no view. No view. <laughs> no. I've got. I, I I I have a view, but that's an opinion. I've got no. I've got no. Okay. Uh, Opinion okay. that's based let, on. Let me rephrase that a little. The civil service reform is on the agenda, has been on the agenda for the last 30, 40 years. We've got a commission on that. That commission has been working for the last, or task force, I should say, has been working for the last two years with not much, not much impact. We've now got a pay commission in place. Uh, the pay commission is going to look at the salaries of the civil servants. So, okay, just give us your opinions, your thoughts on uh, how do you see public sector um you know human resource management how would you in terms of this debate on the civil service reform uh, what are your guidelines i mean your thoughts on it i mean i don't want to pin you down just your thoughts on it how do you think we should go about thinking about it well i think i think there's one fantastic and a role model in in the world that has in my view the best government uh, in uh, in the world and that's singapore how did they do it from the 60s onwards uh, it's about very small steps, uh, the right, taking the right decisions in terms of uh, building a uh, government service that is more competitive and better to work for than the, the, pri the private sector. Uh, so that, 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 would, that would be my only guideline in terms of showcasing what others have done. Uh, but we, we all, we all, uh, my, my, my biggest problem with all these kind of things is that we always look for the, for the silver bullet. We always look for the one single thing that, that solves the problem. Uh, oh. Because as, as Pakistanis, and I'm, I've been here for 20 years, so therefore I see myself as one of them, we always look for shortcuts. We, oh. we, we don't, because uh, it's always about the bird in the hand rather than two in the sky. We always look for shortcuts. And as a result, we make decisions that have the shortest possible uh, uh, of a sort of possible uh, uh, time to come to fruition. Uh, and as a result, we, ne we never get to, uh, to a solution that is sustainable and that, is, uh, that creates that ecosystem that is required. Hmm. Hmm. No, fair point, fair point, I accept that. And that is why um, here at Paid, we are not looking for any silver bullets. We are trying to understand the situation. And that's why I told you we are interested more in analysis and not necessarily whether we give it a positive or a negative spin. So we would be very interested in learning about HRM, which is why we are doing this. And we are very interested in learning about how HRM can be applied across the board, not just in, this, in, in the public, uh, private sector, but also in the public sector. I think we are in in, in dire need of good practices everywhere. And that is exactly why we run into trouble again and again and get back to the IMF or ask for debt rescheduling or whatever, because quite frankly, the country is not growing rapidly. And the reason, the many reasons, not one, there are many, many reasons. And one of the reasons is how we manage our business. I think that could be a very, very important reason because ultimately growth is all about humanity, how we manage our business. And the countries that manage their businesses well, do well. The countries that don't manage their businesses don't do that well. There are tons of books written on it. For example, Neil Ferguson's book I was reading yesterday, The Great Degeneration or the Civilization. He talks about how um, the West conquered uh, the rest of the world. And many books have been written on this purely because they were able to manage their talent better. That is why, folks, we discuss this issue. Pakistan has to start taking its talent seriously, start thinking about how we are managing our talent and what we are doing. And when we question these things, we are not being pessimistic. We really need to question everything because if we don't, we will 
eventually be the only losers in the world as we are right now. So help us continue this questioning. We will do another one of these uh, HR seminars next Tuesday. But this Thursday, day after tomorrow, we've got an excellent one coming for you where somebody is going to talk about how Islamabad was made in the early years of Pakistan, how the development policy in Pakistan was framed and what the discourse was then and how that discourse has shaped itself into the place we are today. So we're going to do some discourse analysis as well as finding out how Islamabad uh, was developed and how Doxia does played a key role on Thursday. I invite you all to join us on Thursday. Meanwhile, Paul, thanks a lot. That was very informative, very nice. We will remain engaged with you. We will call you again and again and hopefully learn from you. Please send us whatever you can, whatever you produce. It will be very nice for PID to learn from you. Thank you. Thank you, all the, everybody. Thank you. All the best. Thank you, you very Bye -bye. much. Thank you. Thank you.